I'd like to call this meeting to order. Today is Tuesday, October 27th. This is a Prescott City Council study session. Let's please call roll. Mayor Mangrelli. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Orr. Here. Councilman Blair. Yes. Councilman Good. Present. Councilmember Rusing. Here. Councilwoman Scholl. Here. And Councilman Sishka. Here. All are present. Very good. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. We have two items on the study session agenda today. Uh, if you'd like to make public comment, please grab a comment card and we will get to that after our council discussion today. Let's start with uh, item 3A, please. Discussion regarding dissolution of the Iron Springs Sanitary Sewer District. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, Craig Dotseth, Public Works. So the Iron Springs Sanitary Sewer District. Uh, to give you a little perspective of, uh, of where we're talking about, we're out Iron Springs Road beyond Williamson Valley Road. The primary district includes, get the mouse up there, includes three subdivisions, Wildwood Estates up here, Kingswood Heights, and then Kingswood Estates. That subsequently also Pine Lakes Estates uh, does send their flow into the district as well. Brief history regards to the district. I mean, very, very brief compared to documents that we have on it here. It was established in 1972 through Yavapai County Board of Supervisors, established the sanitary district. Moving forward, um, items that that directly relate to what we're talking about today. 1987, there was discussions. Um, originally, it was created and it had its own wastewater treatment facility. 1987 came forward to the city um, to discuss the potential of connecting to the city system and send all wastewater generated within the district into the city system to the city's uh, wastewater treatment plants then for treatment. Um, that was discussed in May of 87. Ultimately then in October of 87, there was contract entered into agreement with the city and Iron Springs Sanitary District um, for the sewage flows accepted by the city for treatment from the district. After the district constructs a line to the Willow Creek outfall line from the existing manhole, users shall pay a monthly fee, new connections shall pay buy-in fees, um, in exchange, the district shall remove the existing plant um, and use the FEMA grant funds to construct the line over to the Willow Creek outfall. So that was established where since then, then the city has been receiving the flows from the district. We fast forward again to September 11th, 2002. There was a council agenda memo and discussions were brought forward at that point to consider the absorption of the district collection system into the city of Prescott system. From that presentation and discussion at council, then staff was given the direction to work with the district um, operations staff and, and board to do a full review of the system, to look at the condition of the system, identify any um, items that would need to be brought up to standards to meet city standards. So fixes to the system, corrections to easements, um, all of these things were identified then in a series of memos in 2002-2003 timeframe. The district has been working on those items since. Uh, some of the, the most critical items uh, were related to easements where there was some of the infrastructure did not it was not constructed within the easement that was established. So those were all corrected, as well as then easements for access to do maintenance to it if the city considered to, to take the system over. So those also have all been um, taken care of. There was a list of about 209 items total on the list as far as to work on. The district has been doing repairs and working on those items continually um, since that uh, 2003 timeframe. Um, is every single item finished? No, not every single item is checked off because there are some items on the list that are just questions or comments about the system. Uh, for instance, there's an inverted siphon 
that gets all the flow from Wildwood Estates across Willow Creek to the other side. Inverted siphons, they are a perfectly, you know, capable means of transferring uh, sewage across um, that canyon area. Um, is it our um, most desirable? No, not necessarily. It's just an item that uh, potentially takes a little additional maintenance uh, versus um, a standard gravity line that does not have the inverted siphon. So there's some items like that that, that still exist. So they were just comments in that letter. Um, there has been a couple other discussions since this time frame also bringing forward and kind of updates on uh, where they were with repairs. And I believe that's why uh, Mr. Whittington and uh, Val Ripley are here today to uh, continue discussion with all of you. So John, then we want to turn it over to Val <laughs> and or Bill. Members of Council, I'm Bill Whittington. I represent the Iron Springs Sanitary District. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, I'll speak up just to make sure you can. Um, I know that you've heard about some of this in executive sessions, so uh, we're here mostly to answer your questions if you have any, but I wanted just to share a little bit of background with you. Uh, I want to uh, thank, uh, first thanks Craig Dosseth and his people. We've been working with each other since seriously since 2007 and they've done yeoman's work. I can't tell you how many times they've taken their time to meet us out at the facility. To We've walked every line there is in the ground and every pump in the ground and his expertise has been invaluable as his uh, courtesy has been as well. I'm sure there's times when he wish we'd go away. I also want to thank John for his time. Uh, in the office, we've met many times to talk about the process that could be used to make this happen painlessly as possible. I want to introduce you to Val Ripley. He's the chairman of the board. He's also here to answer any questions you might have. Uh, thanks to Val and the other two board members, uh, this district is still alive. Uh, one of the reasons we're here is because this district won't be alive for long. and We need to make sure that people continue to get water flowing in the right direction. And uh, thanks, to, thanks to Val, that has been happening. Uh, Joan and George, the other two board members, uh, are ill and uh, couldn't join us today, uh, but uh, wanted to send uh, their good wishes to you. Uh, it's a three-member board, as you know. Uh, uh, open meeting law is such that when you only have a three-member board, not a lot gets done unless you have a meeting. So they have lots of meetings. They work for free. And uh, they've been doing it for many, many years. But it's extraordinarily difficult to get people to run for these uh, board positions. Uh, the three board members we have now are uh, holdovers. Uh, no one is even applying for the jobs anymore. We can't get anybody to file petitions. And so it's critical that we get this taken care of before any serious problems occur down the road, either politically or, or uh, by infrastructure purposes. As Craig mentioned, uh, the district's been in, uh, in existence since 1972, and there's been a multiple of residents out there that have served on the three-member board for years and years. Uh, in 1993, you guys entered into an IGA uh, with uh, the district, and thereafter undertook a series of conversations about what had to happen in order for all this, uh, for the district to be blended with the city uh, process. Right now, you guys take all of the sewer and you get a fee for that. The, the residents, there's 465 customers all told, I think. They all pay a fee right now to the district as well as to the city. We're trying to uh, collapse that into uh, one arrangement so that they don't feel like they've been taken advantage of it all. Uh, the, the support is Within, within the district, the residents, the homeowners have been excellent. Our last step to success on this was to approach all these board members and get their consents and to sign easements, uh, both for uh, easements that run across the existing lines. As you can imagine, back in the day, I think it was Bill Cheek that surveyed some of this stuff in, if you remember Bill. Uh, then the lines got put in, and shocker, some of those lines aren't exactly where they were planned, and so we had to go back and get easements from everybody, and we did. 
Uh, sometimes we had to go back and ask for access from the property owners along their driveways or in spots where it would have been convenient for the city to take their equipment in to do clean out and checks without actually having an easement. We got all that taken care of. So everybody's on board, the property owners are ready to go and I think they're anxious to know that uh, water will continue to flow long after the three board members that are here are, are gone. And it will be gone. Um, it's anybody's guess whether they could be replaced, but health issues have plagued these boards for years and we've been lucky, frankly, uh, that those that serve for free on this board uh, have continued to do so. Uh, the city's expertise is invaluable and in many ways has been the reason this district has survived to date. And so I'm, I'm, I'm here to uh, let you know that we've done our homework and uh, we're prepared to move forward. I've been in many conversations with John about the technical process that needs to be handled to get this done. In March, there'll be an election to dissolve the district. But there's also an IGA in place. We need to tweak that a little bit and get things headed in the right direction so it's seamless. And uh, thank you to John and his staff for doing that. But I'm happy to answer any questions you might have or appropriately any questions you want to ask of the board chairman. Glad to do so. Very good. Thank you. Any questions, comments from the council? Yes, council member Rusing. Thank you. Hi, Bill. Um, I'm, uh, I have a question about fire flows. I don't know if this is uh, one for you, but are there fire hydrants out there? And if we take it over, are the uh, city standards uh, going to be the same uh, for fire flows? Because as you know, you know, it is in a very heavily forested area, and I'm just concerned if there's enough fire hydrants yeah. to serve. Those fire hydrants aren't uh, the sanitary district's uh, cup of tea, so I'll turn it over to Craig, if you don't mind. Yeah, definitely. Just so we, so we're talking about sanitary sewer district there. Mm -hmm. The on the water system, it has always been the city's water system, mm -hmm. and yes, there are fire hydrants throughout that, meeting the standard residential uh, spacing for that. Um, in fact, we're doing um, a couple lines of improvements out there right now that are upsizing the system to uh, to improve it even a little bit more. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments regarding the sanitary sewer district? Yeah, I have one, Mayor. Yeah, go ahead. Bill, are there any negative uh, aspects to you dissolving the sanitary um, sanitary district on the city? Oh, I can only see real benefit. I, well, you know, is it ever fun to go service a, a route in a line or a collapsed line, those kinds of things? Those are negatives, but frankly, Craig's people are doing that now. Uh, you know, the district has one engineer. That engineer recently left and went to work down in Parker, so they got another engineer. But those people don't show up to do this. Phone calls are made. And to Craig's uh, credit, those phone calls often end up at his lap. And so he has people going out there at midnight already. And so we find, uh, I, I can't imagine there being a downside to it. You guys already received the water. Uh, you're about to receive the cash that the district has in order to continue main maintenance. The infrastructure has been brought up to snuff thanks to Craig's hard work. Uh, the, the, your, you guys already provide water to the constituents out there, and I think uh, it behooves everybody politically and practically to be able to tell those people that their water will continue to flow both directions and not be interrupted by an emergency. Uh, the three board members on the board, of course, they're unpaid uh, and they're retired and their health is failing and you obviously want, uh, I, I would assume that the upside here is the city will be able to hold its head up high and tell these people that service will continue uninterrupted. When it comes to flushing toilets, an interruption of a day or two is a big thing and it needs to be solved. I can't identify any particular problem that hasn't been dealt with. Uh, that's why we interacted with Craig's office is because there were some repairs that had to be done. There were some easements that had to be obtained. All that's now been taken care of. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Bill, it's nice to meet you. you. Val Ripley, it's good to see you. And uh, this just seems like the right thing to do. And uh, you mentioned the amount of money that was in a balance, and I know 
I think Michael mentioned that to me. What is that amount of money to the balance? I the recall it's a couple of hundred thousand. Okay. I haven't seen that in writing, so I just wondered. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yet, uh, I'm off a little bit, but not sure. much. Sure. Mm -hmm. Just wondered. Yeah. Thank you. Some expenses that are yet to be made. We have an election. Hey, Val. Could you uh, come to the mic because we have folks listening in? Thank you. So, well, that brings up a point, uh, yeah, Val. There so, are it's a few expenses that we've we've uh, line itemed that those funds to be uh, to be available when that comes. But uh, we have that, and uh, primarily just the the cost of turning things over. Sure. So, that's been line itemed aside, and we're just waiting for timing to get it done. Sure. Very good. It's good to see you. Thank you, Val. It's good to see you. Councilman Good. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Ripley is a fellow sun up Rotarian. Uh, for years, you've been telling me how ir irreplaceable you are. Well, it's about time you uh, start believing my words, uh, Phil. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, Craig, I think um, our primary concerns here are the condition of the um, utility district and the um, all the underground pipes and, and everything else. So I, I'm pretty assured that they are in acceptable and, and good condition, so we're not taking on any uh, repair maintenance liabilities. Am I correct there? With the review that was done in the early 2000s, 100% of it was videoed. So then all those videos were watched. That's what created the repair list that they've been working on, the repairs they've completed. Um, is it a brand new system? No. It's a system now where part of it is getting to be 40 years old. Well, almost 50 years old now. Um, so it, it is in good condition. It serves its purpose. It delivers the flow it needs to, um, where it needs to go. There's been numerous repairs completed on it. However, it is an older system. So down the road, it will take some maintenance and repairs. There's a lift station that will have to be maintained. Um, so in, al along the lines, once the flow started coming to the city, every customer on there has been paying the full city sewer bill right. to us every month, and they pay a fee into the district. So the... As far as the customer, they pay the same as a customer that is on our entire operated and maintained system. So these customers are receiving the, the benefit of the treatment, the transport of that from the, you know, to the treatment plant from the edge of their subdivision. So it's just the lines within the subdivisions that we have not been maintaining. So... If there's, if there's a downside, it's that we take on the maintenance of, of those additional lines. However, the customers have been, been paying for it as well as the impact fees when they connect. So do we feel that we have sufficient revenue expectations to be able to uh, continue to maintain it? Uh, obviously, we've had some recent uh, much newer um, water lines with PVC that cost us a ton of money to repair unexpectedly. Um, but with these um, revenue sources, um, are we going to be in uh, good shape to be able to continue the maintenance and keep operation out there um, reliable? Yes. Uh, are there any other liabilities that we might have other than just water and sewer maintenance? I'm sure they're outside the city. No, they're in the city. Wildwood is in the county. Kings, Kingswood is in the city. So we have overlapping um, fire juris jurisdictions there, yep. but we've always had that. Yes, yeah, nothing that changes really there. Change. This is only sewer collection and potential maintenance of the collection system is the only thing we're considering. Would that here. be the same with uh, police, uh, law enforcement, with overlapping um, sheriff and uh, yeah, rescue PD. Yeah, and the based on the wastewater system Correct. changing hands. Yeah, so that's that's a that's a given. All right, I think that's all the questions I have. And the system is inspected quarterly as well. So uh, or anything that may pop up, we get that taken care of right away. Councilman Blair. You know, I don't see a, a downside. <clears throat> and any time you can see an attorney get up there and say it's good knowing he's going to lose his fees, I'm going to trust that attorney. <laughs> so thank you, Bill, for uh, 
being their attorney for all these years, and I'm quite sure that the diligence that the city has gone through under your leadership, Craig, that this system is worthy of taking over. Mr. Powell, uh, if Just to wrap up, um, kind of moving forward, we wanted to introduce this. Obviously, as, as Bill said, we've had this discussion in executive session a couple of times. So this is sort of the introduction to, to you and, and to the public. Um, going forward, as, as Bill mentioned, there'll be an election run by the county elections office on March 11. Um, we're, we're sort of assuming that uh, the majority, if not everybody, will vote to dissolve given, given the benefit. If that occurs um, in between now and then, um, we, there's some details we have to work out because the, that part of the system that is in the city automatically – it can basically automatically goes to the city. Uh, that part that's in the county technically goes to the county, but we're working on some workarounds to that so that the city takes over the whole system because the county cannot provide as the county a, a you know, sewer service. Mm -hmm. um, so we're working those details out. Um, but moving forward, I think, you know, I don't want to speak for Craig, but staff supports this. Um, if nothing else, it gives, it gives, it's probably a relatively small percentage those internal lines are, are a tiny percentage of our overall system, I assume. So, and again, as Craig said, the, those those folks up there are paying the regular sewer fee for both the transport and the and the, and the treatment. Um, but it gives the city sort of the hands-on ability to maintain those lines internally to to prevent any kind of breaks or spills that create you know environmental damage to to the ground or to creeks and those kinds of things. So we're supportive of it, and uh, we, unless there's any objection from council, we'll continue to work with the district and as this thing moves forward and 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 bring forward some other things in sort of in the interim between now and March to resolve the the issue between you know the county uh, unincorporated land. But I, I, just to reiterate, this only deals with sewer. Everything else remains status quo. Very good, sir. Is there any public comment? No, Mayor. All right. Well, thank you all for uh, being here and presenting today. Let's move on to item 3B, please. Discussion regarding cell towers in residential areas. Um, Bryn, did you want me to address what you and I had talked about? I just wanted to state uh, for the record that Councilmember Roosing and Councilman Good um, requested this item, and I, we didn't want to preempt your desires for the discussion, so we um, invite you to set the table for the discussion, and hopefully we've prepared some helpful information for you. Thank you very much. And Mayor, I do have a handout uh, that Councilmember Roosing asked I distribute to Council, so I'll go ahead and do that right now. Okay. Thank you. You want me to begin? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, the reason I wanted to bring this forward is um, monitoring the Yavapai County's uh, development services, um, discussions on some of the um, changes in their uh, code for um, cell towers, um, which they um, decided to um, adopt in a pretty rapid manner because of some of the changes in the uh, Federal Communication Commi Commission's requirements, I felt that it was probably very uh, important that we try to align our uh, city codes for a particularly location of um, cell towers in, in or near residential neighborhoods. So um, as I monitored that, and then also as um, the concern, I think, in the public at large about um, cell tower locations, whether it has anything to do with um, uh, fall uh, areas or uh, aesthetic impacts or potential reductions in property values. Um, but also I've heard from a number of people who've been very concerned about the fact that they have really poor coverage. And uh, not too long ago, we were debating the area over by the basis school off of Prescott Lakes Parkway, which a lot of people would think, well, they, they're so close to in town, they must have really good coverage. Some of those areas were very poor. Um, and then there was a lot of discussion about a big cell tower sticking up in the sky there right next to uh, uh, basis school, but after it was uh, stealthed and uh, even though it's um, one large tree in the middle of almost nowhere, um, it's really kind of blends into the background now. And very few people even 
uh, comment or recognize it. So I thought it would be appropriate to uh, bring this kind of back, even though we did have a study session back in July talking about what the um, FCC uh, restrictions are, what we can and we can't do, what we can and can't discover or, or discuss uh, when we're making these decisions. And even this new uh, shot cock clock requirement that um, the city staff be able to um, review a qualified application and move it forward in a very rapid manner. Otherwise, it is approved by default. So I think uh, a lot of these issues need to be um, kind of discussed in a transparent and open manner with the community at large so they understand what um, authority we have to uh, either modify these conditions or not for that matter. And I think as uh, this 5G technology expands, um, it will probably have more cell towers or at least co-located uh, antennas to provide some of these um, higher volume um, uploads and downloads that 5G is going to be um, providing to the community. So that was my intention of bringing this forward for discussion, not only about current uh, cell towers in the area that are of concern, but also being able to um, align some of our development codes and uh, maybe default requirements for stealthing of these towers in residential areas that we really didn't have in the code before. So that was my intention. Very good. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Mr. Lamar? Yeah, just to follow up on what Phil's saying and kind of set the table for Bryn, um, when she and I met with Councilman Good and the city attorney about what the premise of this would be and what we would talk about, I, I kind of said, well, I think there's a few things we can talk about. We can talk about what the county regulations are now, what they're considering. We can talk about what other, uh, for lack of a better term, topographically challenged communities are doing in terms of cell tower coverage. And then just kind of rehash, and then John's going to do that part, what we legally have the ability to actually regulate. So I think that kind of sets the framework of what Brent's put together, if she would agree that that's the case. Absolutely. Very good. Uh, Councilmember Roosing has a comment first. Oh, I just wanted to say thank you for having the study session, and hopefully we can uh, find a middle ground and uh, respect everyone's wishes. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Bren Stotler with Community Development. So we have um, basically put together some information that follows along with the uh, the foundations that Councilman Good and, and uh, City Manager Lamar have have laid out for us today. And what we thought we'd just start with first is looking at, since the, the Yavapai County Code sort of big this conversation, looking at what current Yavapai County Code and current Prescott uh, cell tower code include. And why don't I just go to Prescott first since we're here and we're, we're uh, in charge of this process. Our Prescott development code uh, requires a special use permit for cell towers that exceed the height allowed by the zoning district. So towers must meet the zoning district height. In most cases, our residential districts allow for 35 feet in height of any building or structure. Um, so they must meet the zoning uh, district height and the setbacks or obtain a special use permit. And that special use permit process involves going through the Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, presenting staff's analysis of any application, and then allowing the applicant to um, also present their application. And then, of course, the, the standard process where public comment is invited and the Planning and Zoning Commission makes a recommendation to council. Council is the, are the final decision makers for these uh, special use permits. Guy wires and accessory structures, oh, sorry, towers must be set back from any lot line, the, a distance that's equal to the height of the tower. This is a foundational piece of code that is probably found in almost every jurisdiction's cell tower code. However, it's become a little bit less uh, critical because of the design and engineering of these towers now. They're actually most, most are set to self-collapse instead of falling over as one single unit. So engineering has served this industry by um, creating safer conditions when you have uh, potential tower collapses. And most of the applications that we see today include that self-collapsing uh, condition. 
guy wires and accessory structures. Typically there's an accessory structure that is set just apart from the tower slightly and it houses all of the equipment that is necessary to operate the tower. So those structures must satisfy the minimum zoning requirements and setback requirements of the district that they're requested in. The special use permit process allows council to grant height and setback adjustments when it gets to their final decision making on any application. Current Yavapai County Code uh, basically states no new wireless communication facilities may be within 1,000 feet of a residence. There are use permits, and that's the final bullet, but I'll mention that now. Use permits may be applied for to re reduce those setback requirements, and because we have a former county planner on our city planning staff, we know that those use permits um, and essentially a waiver were pretty routinely asked for. So the industry has set itself up to acknowledge codes, but also find ways to um, adapt a tower situation to a particular site. Sometimes that requires a use permit so that an, and a waiver can be affected for the applicant. So the exception of attached antenna and concealed antenna sites that do not exceed 10 feet above the maximum building height reviewed on a case, are reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. This is a reference to the fact that now cellular antennas can be actually affixed to buildings. Sometimes camouflage is just part of the face of a building. Um, it's a good opportunity if you are in the right place. Uh, additionally, for those wireless communication facilities that exceed the 10 feet above the maximum building height, and in Yavapai County, in residential districts, the maximum building height is consistent across residential zoning at 30 feet. So they're five feet less than our typical uh, building or structure height requirement. And when those wireless communication facility sites exceed 10 feet above that maximum building height for the district, there is a 10 foot setback for every one foot of tower height to the nearest residence with a minimum of 1,000 feet. So again, we're referring to tower collapse scenarios that may or may not be in play due to today's engineering. And again, use permits may be applied for to reduce those setback requirements. So uh, Yavapai County Planning and Zoning Commission and the Board of Supervisors do hear a fair amount of those use permit applications because cell tower uh, sites don't always, and the code don't always align perfectly. So let's talk about what Yavapai County is proposing. Towers will be permitted by right in their residential district. The R1L district is their primary residential district. Permitted by right, by right means they don't have a public hearing process to go through if they meet certain criteria. And that criteria is as follows. The minimum parcel size is two acres. As we know, most of the county's underlying zoning is two acre minimum. The maximum height of the tower is 60 feet. Similarly to existing code, towers must be set back from any lot line a distance equal to the height of the tower unless that engineered proof of collapse is provided uh, with the application. Um, if not, zoning district setback supply. Full stealth design is required as approved by the development service director, services director. Full stealth design means some form of camouflage, making a tower look like a tree, a palm tree, um, attaching it to a building, which is, as I mentioned, a good option. Stealth design is to match the characteristics and colors of the surrounding community. That could be pretty subjective and difficult to manage, but um, you do understand the impetus behind that. Folks want not to see these towers. They want the towers to sort of blend in with the environment and disappear from the visual field. The tower shall utilize the least intrusive design to fill a significant gap in coverage. And I think that all of us have heard this phrase uh, throughout our study sessions. Uh, this is actually straight out of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. It requires that the tower shall be the least intrusive design across all options and has to fill a significant gap in coverage. So the applicant has to prove that there's a gap in service coverage and that this tower um, and, and its design will address that gap. All ground equi equipment shall be concealed by an eight foot CMU walled enclosure. That's very common with cell tower installations. So you'll see that all of the equipment that is amassed to service the tower typically is found within an eight foot walled enclosure. Um, and that's something that we see throughout Prescott as well. And again, exceptions are possible through the use permit process. 
So if folks that come in, at their tower proposal don't meet these criteria, or doesn't meet these criteria, they have the option to apply for a use permit and go through the public hearing process to achieve those, uh, those parameters that they need to install the tower as they proposed it. Since Yavapai County is, is more characteristically rural, um, not to say that there aren't top topographical challenges, we wanted to also look at some communities that have more similar topography to ours. Um, I think that some of the tower placement issues we find in Prescott have to do with hills, mountains, valleys, uh, and just the challenge of building in the mountain environment. So Durango is smaller than Prescott, but also has some of those features. And their existing code states that towers are not allowed within or closer than 250 feet to residential zone boundaries. So they have made an exclusion here where they don't want to see towers in residential zones, and they in fact want to buffer residential zones from towers. No new tower will be permitted within 8,000 feet of an existing tower unless it's been demonstrated that there is no capacity and no option to co-locate. Um, again, these sites must be designed for co-location and that's something that we see in our own code as well. Administrative processes apply if all of these standards are met. So again, that re does not require a public hearing process. It appears from our analysis that communities are leaning more towards criteria that allows cell towers to be permitted by right under certain circumstances and the option to uh, gain waiver or use permit or special use permit for those scenarios that don't fit the criteria. And once again, stealth is a requirement in Durango and I apologize, there was a typo in your packet. We corrected the slide, but stealth is a requirement in Durango. Oh, it is. Okay. Yes, and I think that's pretty typical for most current tower code if it's been kept up to date because that really is the industry standard these days. All right, let's talk about Payson. Conditional use permit is required in residential districts, so similar to our, uh, our code, they allow a tower in a residential district but they have to go through the public hearing process. Maximum height of 100 feet. Lattice type with guy wires prohibited. So picture the older style of cell tower where it was kind of a, a boxed unit that climbed uh, the full height of the tower. I think it allowed probably service access um, by being constructed that way. But this, this is really a, uh, a design that's gone, you know, it's kind of gone away over time. We don't require these lattice type. They're more visually obstructive. Um, they just, uh, they just don't, don't need to be constructed that way and it actually just presents less of a visual obstruction. Um, so that is true in Payson and all towers shall be set back 25 feet from any property line. That would appear to acknowledge that today's towers really have that self-collapsing feature because they're not concerned with an entire tower needing to be contained on the property that is situated on. And again, in Payson, it must be stealth or camouflaged. Flagstaff, a little closer to home. They require, stealth, they require stealth and stealth communication facilities are permitted by right with a concept site plan and that is an administrative process. Residential areas are considered, quote, disfavored. Uh, Flagstaff actually approaches this by having a preferred location. That might be another infrastructure site, a city or municipal site. Um, something that is not uh, adjacent to residential area. Then they have neutral locations and that uh, encompasses an, a number of other sites that where they would, um, the tower would not really um, impact a residential neighborhood such as any of their commercial districts. And then residential being the disfavored category, um, meaning that they would prefer to see towers in other places besides residential districts if at all possible. So the disfavored uh, residential areas actually um, limit the height allowed to 60 feet or five feet above the average maximum height of the foliage within 200 feet of the proposed facility. So this really kind of gets into the, into the weeds, but you can see where they're going with it. They're contexting the tower against the backdrop of the landscape in Flagstaff, which is largely alpine, heavily treed, and mountainous. So they've allowed for that by 
um, you know, sort of taking into consideration what the tower is next to and how they can utilize that environment to make the tower drop out of sight. Okay, so, but the, the foliage within 200 feet of the proposed facility, but in no case greater than 70 feet with landscape screening around the compound to mitigate visual impacts. So again, they're quite concerned with having the tower disappear to the visual eye. And then Flagstaff all, also um, requires that any tower installation requires co-location, shall allow for co-location. And again, I think that's pretty standard across most jurisdictions today. So let's get back to the authorities a little bit. What authority does the city have to regulate cell towers? Local jurisdictions cannot prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting the provisions of personal wireless services. The federal government has taken the position that this is something that all people need to have access to and we should facilitate um, the installation of these towers to ensure that everybody has adequate coverage. It also means, though, that a, a local jurisdiction cannot deny a cell tower application if the proposed cell tower is the least intrusive means. You've heard uh, Attorney Palladini speak to this before. If it's the least intrusive means to cover a significant gap in personal wireless service, the jurisdiction cannot deny the application. The conversation, of course, is about determining what is the least intrusive means and what type of significant gap are we, are we talking about. Other requirements um, of the city, we cannot discriminate, prohibit, or have the effect of prohibiting personal wireless service. We also must act within a reasonable period of time, the reference to the shot clock. Uh, that is within the federal, federal framework. We've had applications that have taken a variety of periods of time to get through the process. I will say that when they go be beyond what is established by the federal government, it's with the cooperation of the applicant. It has to be with the cooperation of the applicant. If the applicant isn't uh, in agreement that additional process is needed or more public input, um, then they can assert that the shot clock has been violated and the city could find itself in a bit of, um, have an issue with, with uh, resolving that application in a timely ma manner. The city also cannot deny on the basis of environmental effects of radio frequency emissions. Um, I think we've, we've all read a fair amount of uh, data studies and assertions about the environmental effects of radio frequency emissions, but this basically comes down to um, the assertion that these waves or these tower installations can cause health issues. And there is a lot of information out there if you're searching for it on this aspect. It's just something that we can't deny an application based on those assertions. The denial of an application must be in writing. So if the council chose to deny an application, they have to be prepared to put in writing a statement of why they've denied it, essentially creating a record that might elevate to uh, a higher court or some other scenario. What must the applicant show? They must show that the cell tower closes that significant gap in their own coverage uh, and in the loose, least intrusive way possible. They must provide a meaningful comparison of other sites, various sites. They must state why they chose the site they've chosen to proceed with. And I think that we learned through potentially the last study session, but uh, also a couple of recent neighborhood meetings um, that uh, Various sites are considered, but the planning process for these sites starts three years in advance. So the, the carriers are always adapting and monitoring the coverage in, in certain areas where cell towers exist and where they are needed. Uh, the applicant must also show that the proposed site is the best available to address that gap and that the proposed site is best technologically feasible for the site. And that might, for, for placement of the tower, that might mean on an existing infrastructure parcel, something where there are other um, municipal infrastructure present. The application also must comply with the city's land development code and ordinances. So at the base, they have to, per that original first slide that I, that I uh, presented, they must, um, uh, they must uh, comply with our local codes and ordinances. 
some additional requirements. The applicant must show a lack of available and technologically feasible alternatives. It's just another way of saying some of the other uh, points on the past slide. And it is appropriate to ask the applicant to study alternative sites, alternative designs, and alternative technologies. So they really do have to come in and demonstrate that the site that they've selected is the best from many, many angles. We've included John's legal presentation on the back end of ours in case uh, any questions came up where we would want to rely on any of the slides or, or information presented at the earlier study session. Um, that's the information we compiled for today's discussion. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Well, thank you, Bren. Uh, questions, comments from the council? Council Member Rusi. Oh, I, um, I just have a, uh, a statement I'd like to make. I have a little presentation, and I just wanted to know if I should do it now or after Mr. Palladini, however you want uh, to you do can it. Well, Mayor, I wasn't planning on going over this uh, since we already already went over these slides. Unless you want me to, I thank you. I can address <laughs> I can address <laughs> specific questions on legal issues as they come up. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Council Member. Okay. Thank you. Um, I gave you all uh, a handout with some highlights of our uh, current um, zoning ordinance and. Um, First of all, uh, thank you, and I would like to state that I have a cell phone with Verizon, and I realize that cell towers are very essential part of our lives and of our for our communication system and for fire police and for the public. In fact, I'd like to put a plug in for Hidden Valley Ranch. It's a neighborhood off of uh, White Spar, and they've been wanting to uh, have somebody come out and uh, see if they can locate a cell tower in their neighborhood. They have a hill right in the middle of their uh, subdivision with a water tank on it, and uh, unfortunately, everyone has to use a, uh, an extender in their service is very spotty, so I was wondering if maybe we could look into that. But however, the process of locating cell towers has been a cause of great stress and anxiety within our neighborhoods and leaves much to be desired. Homeowners in residential neighborhoods are concerned about decreased property values by having an 80-foot cell tower in a large cinder block walled enclosure literally in their backyards. And I feel as an elected official that I need to support private property rights and our property values. So let me get into a little history back in the olden days, back into the when we had those huge girder style uh, cell towers structures. Um, there was a cell tower farm planned on top of uh, Indian Hill, right in the Country Club Circle neighborhood, and um, of about six towers there. And then, of course, there was a cell tower that was going to be located on the hill right in front of our Pioneer home. And then there was another one proposed to be located across from Charlotte Hall, right off of Gurley in the Sacred Heart um, Church parking lot. And then also several towers were proposed over the years in the vicinity of the YRMC Medevac Chopper landing pad and flight zone. So as you can see, uh, this has been uh, something that the city and the residents have been uh, dealing with, not just on, you know, for function, but also, I know we're not supposed to talk about it, but for aesthetic uh, values. And um, residents will uh, buy a home next to a water tank, and then they're surprised that a cell tower is going to be going in many years later, creating an industrial park. Mayor, can I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but... We cannot talk about particular applications, and, and, and you sort of went into this particular application that's pending. I ask you to not talk about no, I'm the one particular that's been in the past. We've had well, several similar cases in the past, but okay. let me continue. I'm Just going to talk about the zoning. Cautioning you that we're not on an agenda to talk about any pending application. Okay. Thank you. Um, very few people know that here in Prescott, on our residentially zoned lots, your neighbor can put in a million gallon water tank cell towers, mausoleums, and cemeteries, all without changing the zoning to business, commercial, or industrial. Or also that the city or a telecommunication company can buy the lot next to you and do the same. All you need to do is pull a special permit and get it approved. So essentially, here in Prescott, there is no such thing as residential zoning. In all practicality, we are in one big industrial zone. 
I feel that residential zoning should be for residential uses only. If you look at our 300 page uh, zoning ordinance code book, there's approximately 125 uses that are excluded from residential areas. So I say let's protect our residential homes and change these zoning ordinances so they are fair and consistent. We could use Flagstaff as a model. We could modify our codes so that they're less uh, controversial. And I just feel that an applicant must get the zoning changed to business, commercial, or industrial first, and then get the permits for non-residential use. So for example, if you look at the handout, you'll see that there's six residentially zoned areas. And the arrow shows that it goes from most restrictive to least restrictive. So our zoning uh, for residential should be the most restrictive. And then if you look at the second page, under public, civic, and institutional use categories, uh, all you have to do is get a conditional use permit, apparently, and you can put a cemetery and a mausoleum in uh, your residentially zoned neighborhood in lots. And then if you look at the last page, under um, specific use, under all the residential uh, zones, you can put in uh, telecommunication facilities, major utilities, which are million gallon water tanks, minor utilities, and utility installation and services. So I would just like to point this out. I think over the years, uh, this has become a, a point of great stress. And I think it's time that we deal with it. We have new technology. And I think we can uh, come to a happy medium. But like I said, I think if you buy a residential lot and you move into a platted residential suburb, you shouldn't have to deal with somebody that's able to put a cemetery or a million gallon water tank uh, right next to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Councilman Blair. Um, 19 years is about the 30th time I've heard this and it hasn't changed. Uh, the only problem that I have is the fact that the city's involvement with the utilities, it seems to me that where you want to locate a tower is on a water tank. It's already compromised, period. So the land above my house has a water tank and nine cell towers on top of it, including the fire department, the police department, and everybody else. That's where they belong. For a standalone cell tower in a residential neighborhood is beyond me why we could ever let that happen. Uh, we have areas within the city of Prescott where the city should be responsible for dealing with utilities to have them look at those areas of cell tanks and that whether Ms. Rusing calls them cell farms or not, that property is already compromised as far as I'm concerned for view or anything else. So to locate and co-locate should be what the city pushes for on compromised parcels already that would serve the purpose. When you drive through the Granite Dells area by uh, Public Works, I have um, Sprint, I have no service. But yet there's a cell tower right to the right that somebody owns, and the city of Prescott should be aggressive enough to say we need to co-locate for complete coverage and service to the residential neighborhoods. We have the hills, we have the different sites, whether it's at the mall on a flagpole, that should be co-located for all carriers. Um, you know, there's people making money behind Savoini's, um, old Savoini's feed store. They have a cell tower back there. I think it's a monopole. City of Prescott uh, has allowed the school districts to make extra money by having a cell tower on Roost Street. It needs to be co-located. We would have half the problem we have today with applications if the city was more aggressive about co-locating these towers on already compromised parcels. And I don't believe they should be in residential neighborhoods unless the parcels are compromised. And when you start looking at the different places, Indian Hill, it's compromised. It's got a big tank on it. Up there on Thumb Butte, we got a water tank on it. Those monopoles should be attached directly to the water towers. Therefore, we don't have an abundance of outbuildings surrounding another tank. I mean, we can do this the right way, and I think that is what we need to look at. Any other comments from the council? Yeah, Mayor, I'd like to add, 
One of the things that we're starting to see is the very large um, residential developments expand. We have so many uh, residential uh, single-family homes with very, very little um, uh, community parks or commercial areas that maybe are originally platted but end up uh, not being developed. So we almost get forced into putting a um, um, cell tower in a residential area because otherwise you don't get coverage in there. So I think that's another consideration that we should uh, include in our um, deliberations over uh, large developments that um, there is a specific area designed and set aside for future um, telecommunication um, facilities so that um, neighbors don't get up in arms by saying, gee, I bought this nice um, relatively high density uh, area plot and built my house and now I've got a big cell tower next door because um, the developers want to maximize their single family home uh, development profitability and the last thing they want to do is to work on the non-profitable um, kind of common areas or um, I know there was an area that was set aside out in Grand Dells Estates for a small um, maybe a couple of restaurants and a and a um, kind of what you'd you'd see in a typical small strip mall. And then they ended up uh, uh, re, replatting that and, and putting in more homes. So that's an example of how if we are a little more um, diligent about keeping those commercial areas commercial, then we'll be able to put in um, communication facilities without um, someone getting up in arms after they've um, built and, and designed their residential area. So I think that could be very valuable as well. Mayor, I just, I have to kind of caution the council um, about trying to an outright ban of cell towers in, in residential zones. I, I, I think that if you talk to the industry folks, and we heard somebody here who's, who, who wasn't paid by, he's actually one of our consultants, communications consultant, talking about the technology of cell towers when we did our presentation in July. Um, and I think what we heard was that given the topography of, of Prescott, you can't say, well, we should do what Prescott Valley does because there's just a huge difference in terms of topography and, and p imposing, for instance, what the county does currently, which is 1,000 feet uh, by right or, or you know, less, uh, uh, fewer feet with the permit. It's, it's a very different, you're comparing you know, I, I, you're comparing apples and Volkswagens. I mean, they're completely different kind of kind of um, examples. So, um, and, and it's the same when you say in what the county is looking at is saying a minimum of a two-acre lot. Well, that's the county standard zoning. Whereas in Prescott, we have 6,000 square foot lots, 10,000 square foot lots for residential use. So, I think you have to compare like things alike. So, so in terms of what I'm, I'm kind of hearing from the council. Um, is that, you know, is that there is some push to sort of prohibit or ban um, cell towers in residential zones. But again, I, I would caution against that because I think what you're going to find is that it would have the effect, um, it would prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting the providing of wireless service in those zones given our topography. Council Member Roosing made the comment we should look at the Flagstaff model, um, which which allows in residential, which probably it, it, that's sort of I think what Councilmember Blair is talking about is we should we should look at sort of doing favored, neutral, and disfavored locations, and and pushing people to either city land or city parcels, industrial, or if it's in residential already compromised, Councilman Blair's word, um, locations like where where there are other utilities, other water towers, other other um, uh, communications facilities, 
schools that are in in the you know in the residential area, those kinds of things. So that may be a potential solution. But remember that if we if we use the Flagstaff model, even in a disfavored location, you can go to sixty to seventy feet as a matter of right, as long as it's stealth. So um, it, you know, and I, I say this sort of tongue in cheek, but um, I guarantee you the staff would love to not have to process a special use permits for cell towers because it's a lot a lot of work, you know, and and it's and it's a lot of controversy. So um, I think we have to kind of figure a blended. If we're if you're going to want to change things um, from what we currently have, it's probably going to have to have some a little bit of here and a little bit of there to try and figure out what's best for Prescott because we can't just say let's take the Prescott Valley model and impose it here or the county model and impose it here because they're just too different. Uh, they're too unlike. Um, so you know, we I, I don't have any problem looking at at different models and and kind of pick you know, cherry picking the best, but it has to work here, not just from the land use perspective, but from the, from the industry perspective to make sure that, um, that, that we, that, that provision of wireless service is available to everyone here. Cause we all know that for 97% of the people, that's your only form of communication landlines just are a thing of the past. Councilmember Rosen. Thank you. Oh, I just want to clarify, I was not talking about banning cell towers uh, legally. You can't do that. I was just talking about um, looking into uh, having a residentially zoned lot have to be changed to a business, commercial, or industrial zone first, and then move on with the applications. Okay, and, and I, I did hear that, and I, I guess I, I should probably ca comment and, and c caution that 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 you know the, the collateral damage of something like that is you, you know sort of one of those be careful what you ask for because if somebody were to get rezoned if, if, assuming they could get through the rezoning you've got legal issues one you've got what's called spot zoning you can't just take a residential lot and convert it to a commercial lot um, in, in a in a subdivided neighborhood I think second you have general plan consistency or, or, or lack of consistencies with general plans. But third, even if you got it through somehow and it legally withstood challenges, you're going to put a bodega or a mini market in the middle of a neighborhood because that, that business zoning is going to allow for not just a cell tower in the corner of the lot, but a retail, you know, 7-Eleven or something or some little local, you know, so you got to be careful about, um, require, you know, I don't think legally you, you can, I don't think legally you can require that both under the, the, the Telecommunications Act or under Arizona land use or zoning law because it would amount most likely to what's called spot zoning. So, I, I, again, I'm not trying to be an obstructionist here, but I, I think we have to, if you're going to want to change things down the road, um, there are some simple changes like mandating stealth on all cell towers. And I think the industry would have no problem with that. Um, I think if you're going to change our land use code to limit um, what can go into residential zones, um, that's a kind of a bigger bite to, to bite off. Um, but if we want to look at things like what Flagstaff does with this sort of three-tiered um, three -tiered type of you know, a cell tower decision, then that's something doable too. It seems like it makes sense with stealth and co-locate that would – um, yeah, well, and, kind of and you know, co-location is a really good concept, but everybody has to remember that if there's not city infrastructure and there's a shortage or a lack of service, that's why they put the tower up. So somebody has to make the initial investment mm -hmm. to get the coverage to start before you can put somebody else's antenna on an existing pole. So it's not a panacea across the board because... By the very nature of why they're putting the antenna up is to improve cell service. Somebody has to make an initial investment to improve the cell service. Mm -hmm. Are you all following what I'm saying? Yep. I mean, yeah, it makes sense. Bren, do you have? But, but they should be encouraged by the sure. city to do that. And rather than a cell company coming in and saying, here's what we're telling you we got to have, and we're going, no, no, no. What we're going to tell you you need to go to first sure. is to where there's already compromised situation. I can use Spring, Stringfield Ranch as an example. I, I can go out there, with, if he develops in the county or in the city, I can be one of those smart guys that went up there and bought the highest lot and then get a cell tower company to come in. And my goodness gracious, I'm going to make $15,000 a year, and I'm going to get six of those puppies up on top of that hill. 
Now all of a sudden I'm making a hundred thousand dollars a year. What a return on my investment. That can happen. But what they need to be encouraged instead of something like that is to go to the tower that's across the street that's already got a water tank on it. That's what we have to do. Mm-hmm. And then the other point is I it would be interested the research for lar- specifically for large residential development projects. Have other communities looked at set aside areas for cell tower coverage? It would take some coordination between the cell provider and the developer because a developer could say, "I want to put you here," but that doesn't improve long term coverage. Um, but it'd be interesting to see other places if they've done something like that because I actually think that's an interesting idea. Yeah, that was a good idea. Yeah, if you can get it done in the planning stage ahead of time. Bryn, did you have something to add to the conversation? Uh, I- Attorney Palladini made most of my points regarding the issues that we face with spot zoning, a commercial site within a residential area. Very problematic, um, probably almost as uphill uh, with neighborhood input as a cell tower placement itself. Um, And then, of course, that zoning approval would convey to that owner all of the uses that are allowed in that zoning district, not just a cell tower. So we have to think of the unintended consequences when we when we think about situations like that. Um, And it it doesn't really align with our current code um, to to handle it that way. The the third thing that I think is easy to I'm sorry, Mayor. uh, do something about fairly rapidly would be the ground infrastructure being camouflaged or fenced in a manner that it's less intrusive. I think because I think that's happening already. So mandating that happen is not really going to change the industry. Yeah. Except show that we're taking an additional protective measure for the residents. I think. Yeah, the eight foot CMU wall is really the typical condition when it comes to housing that equipment. Um, And to get back to uh, Councilman Blair's uh, point about co-location, we have an inventory of all of our cell tower sites and we review that when an an application comes in to see if any of those sites align with possible co-location. So that's already um, a box that we attempt to check and of course we encourage um, the applicants to review those opportunities uh, upon receipt of their application. The other thing that I would note is that our most recent largest master plan annexations have included um, set aside acreage for quote municipal slash civic uses. That could look like a lot of things. That could look like a police substation or a fire station. Um, it could be a water tower. It it could also be a cell tower. And public safety cell towers are uh, would be a prime example of of where we would locate those services. Good. Thanks, Brent. Councilman Good. Yeah, I um, also didn't want to. Have a have anybody uh, jump to the conclusion that I'm uh, against um, more effective telecommunication in residential areas, but I just think we need to um, give more thought to how we design our um, codes in this area. Um, Businesses generally like to have predictability. So if we can uh, establish these codes requiring stealthing and and, um, different uh, criteria that are reasonable, both for the uh, provider and for the resident um, so that somebody who buys a lot in the uh, back part of Yavapai Hills that's in that uh, valley down there and they have no cell service and they're really worried about uh, fire or police uh, response because they can't even uh, make that call, they have as much um, concern and expectation as someone who's uh, right next to a, a commercial um, tower and they're worried about the aesthetics or the uh, reduction in property value, etc. cetera. So um, we have to kind of balance the two concerns, but being able to incorporate it into our uh, building codes and our land development codes allows the um, p- provider, whether it's Verizon or, or T-Mobile or whatever, to have a pretty good understanding of where and how and and under what conditions they need to put an application in and it's gonna get approved and not be very expensive to move it forward. I think uh, we've been pretty pretty lucky to have um, the representative from Verizon be quite flexible in this area, but by the same token, under the FCC guidelines with these mandatory shot clock periods, we may end up with another provider who's saying, 
Darn it, I got my application in, it was approved, and I'm going to get this uh, built by default. And then we really will have um, people kind of up in arms at that. So the time to uh, put together some reasonable expectations is now, rather than um, having to maybe fight um, later on with both the community and the, um, and the service requirements. So that's the reason why I really wanted to bring this forward and start uh, thinking about it and designing some things so that we um, can have understandable uh, guidelines and the public at large knows what to expect. Very good. Council Member Rusing? Oh, I, I agree with uh, Councilman uh, Good. Um, I just want to say thank you for starting the conversation. It's something that we need to do, and hopefully we can be a catalyst to make some changes and develop a code that will be comprehensive and people will uh, know what to expect. And um, I just still wonder why we need to have cemeteries and mausole mausoleums on residentially zoned lots. <laughs> Council Michelle. Thanks, Mayor. I guess um, maybe to kind of wrap up, what I'd like to see moving forward is maybe some menu options of, of tweaks and changes we could make that would work for Prescott and maybe come back at another study session to more thoroughly discuss what specifically would work for Prescott and what we'd like to move forward on. Councilwoman Michelle, I, I think I've heard some general consensus about a few things that we could start as a baseline and you guys correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think mandating the stealthing of towers in a residential zoning is something that there seems to be a general consensus. That the walling in of ground support infrastructure that's appropriate for the neighborhood is a given. Um, and then I think the relo the co-location as a goal, but a demonstration by the provider that they've exhausted the opportunity to co-locate now, I don't know what that language looks like yet, and I think we'll have to massage it, but those seem to be at least three items where there's general agreement. Am, am I correct in that regard? I'd say so, yeah. Councilman Sishka. Well, once again, as hard as it may seem to believe, I appreciate Councilman Good for bringing this up. Um, you know, I think that, uh, Bryn, I wanted to ask you a question. Sure. Typically, is it the the cell tower provider that drives this conversation? Have we ever inserted ourselves in this before they've actually come to us and said, we want to put it here, or we need, a, we need more coverage here? I'm going to defer to Mr. Worley on this because he has 20 years of experience placing cell towers in the city of Prescott. So let's invite George up. Yeah. Flip phones. Just to point out that I was 12 when I started doing that. So. <laughs> um, no, normally it is the provider who comes to us. They, they have identified an area, uh, they have data on their coverage, they have data on um, the number of, uh, of potential customers or e existing customers and what their deficits are. So generally they drive the conversation. Uh, we react with our process, the SUP process. Um, we steer them to city locations if they're close enough to cover the area that they're seeking to cover. So if we have a utility site, uh, generally speaking, all of our water tanks, actually more than generally speaking, all of our water tanks are on hilltops. Hilltops are great places to put antennas if you're mm -hmm. looking for coverage. Now it makes them visible, but if you're trying to cover a larger area, that's where you want to go. And we have a number of them in, on city uh, water tank sites for that very reason. So driven by the industry, reacted to by the community and the city. Well, let me ask you this. Is it a possibility that we could insert ourselves in that process and be proactive? It's certainly a possibility, yes. Um, I think one of the things that we would run into problems with, though, is polling the telephone providers to find out what their needs are so that we can offer locations that address those needs. Mm -hmm. They're very reluctant to give up information that may be proprietary. They don't want their competitors to find out that they have a deficit in an area, though I'm sure they all spy on one another and know that. Um, but offering up particular locations through the process, and Bryn mentioned it in her presentation, that Flagstaff uses a preferred 
versus neutral versus not preferred is a great way to do that. If we make it easy to go to a preferred site, they may weigh it a little differently, even if it doesn't address fully what they're looking for. They may have another site that has a more complicated process to go through that covers better, but this with the less complicated process may be good enough for them. So having that weighted th three types of locations, three categories of locations with um, the preferred sites being the easiest to get through, perhaps even an administrative process handled by staff, would be one way to encourage them and to drive it from the city's perspective rather than just wait on them to come to us. Well, you know, as you know, good enough just isn't. So uh, <laughs> um, my question is this, um, you know, we've known for a long time that there's a stretch of one of our highways coming into town that has not, you know, basically you might as well turn your phone off. And uh, we've known that for a long time. So how do we insert ourselves in that situation and get coverage for that area? I mean, that's my question is, how do we, how do we proactively deal with this? Build one in the city right of way and then charge them to locate on it. And that's actually partially that's the That's the point I've been trying to make. We have the ability to do that as a city and we're making the revenues off of it to put back in the general fund. It seems ridiculous because we already know where the dead zones are. So the city can be aggressive about it and say, if we build it, will you come? One of the things that technology is doing right now is, is using small cell sites as an easier approach. So instead of one big tower that covers a giant circle, you have a lot of smaller locations often attached to utility infrastructure like light poles. And those types of facilities often exist in rights of way. You mean so like what they put up at the top of um, uh, Montezuma? Montezuma. On the, on the, yes uh, and no. Actually, you, you can get facilities that will blend in with the utility poles a lot better than that. So that's yeah. actually a <laughs> large cell site. Oh, okay. Um, I stand th corrected. Think of the, the, the installations at the high school that are on top of the, the, light, the, the field light fixtures. Those are almost invisible unless you know to look for them. You see a light pole, you're at a field, you drive right by, you don't see anything up above. That type of, of technology is available for city street lights or traffic signal poles, and that, that's coming along. We don't have it here yet, but it's coming this way. So that may take part of some of, of, of the issues with coverage without creating these, the needs for 60 or 70 foot towers. So that, that is one thing to consider that the technology will fill some of those gaps. The other alternative is if we own property and we want to offer it up, again, you need to provide an incentive for them to go there instead of the better location on private property at the top of the hill that's most visible. That's right. And that, that's another thing that we can use our utility installations for, water tank sites. Thank you. you. Well, one thing you could do along the lines of what Councilman Blair is saying is you could conceivably look at city-owned properties put out a request for proposals where you know there are dead zones on those properties and then encourage the provider to put the tower on city on land. That's right. Um, a special use permit. Yeah. Right. Councilmember Rusi. Oh, I would just like to offer some anecdotal um, comment. Um, when iPhones first came out, they were a lot simpler and more space was allotted to uh, the antenna portion. So you would get much better bars and coverage than you would with uh, a newer iPhone. So as phones get more and more advanced, they allocate less space to, um, to the antennas. So I just wanted to make that point. All right. Uh, is there any other council comment? No? Public comment? I don't have anything in the Zoom call, Mayor, but I do have a speaker card from Terry Sapio. Hi. My name is Terry Sapio. I've been uh, living in the same house in a topographically challenged development for 33 years and one week today. And back when we moved into our house, 
Uh, cell phones didn't, we, nobody had cell phones. Now we all have cell phones. And cell phones have become a utility that is similar to water, sewer, and in part of the infrastructure such as roads. And in the 33 years that I've lived here, I've seen tremendous growth, and as we all have. And uh, Prescott's worked very hard to keep up with its infrastructure, to keep up with that growth. And cell phones, is an infrastructure that has to keep up with the growth of our city. Um, I'm a retired airline pilot for Southwest Airlines, and uh, I've driven to Phoenix for, 30, uh, for 31 years that I flew at Southwest. And the drive from, I won't say the name of the development, but topographically challenged development, has topography in its name. Um, <laughs> Uh, the drive from my development to Cordes Junction over that 31 years, in spite of the growth, has always remained exactly 30 minutes. Has not changed, the driving time has not changed in, in the 31 years. So, uh, back when um, I moved into our development, um, there is the highest point of this to, uh, 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 topographically challenged neighborhood had a 1.5 million gallon water tank on top of this hill, uh, making it already a compromised location. No houses existed around that water tank at all. And now that, and Phil Good has got a great idea of future developments to have future developments plan in their development plan sites for the infrastructure of cellular communications. But back when my development was built, nobody had cell phones, so nobody thought about where are we gonna locate a cell tower because they, they didn't exist. Beepers existed, but not cell phones. So since we already have a compromised location in our development with a 1.5 million gallon water tank, and the people that bought those lots next to the tank and built houses next to the tank knew that it was already compromised when they bought those lots. I think it's a great location for a new cell tower because where I am in, in my particular development for the last 33 years, cell phone reception is terrible. We have to go outside of our home, sit on the front deck or back deck or front porch to make a phone call and it still breaks up and oftentimes the call will fail. And um, I did my own test, similar to the, the test that apparently um, Verizon did, where uh, on my cell phone I have um, speed tests and I went around the neighborhood and took many tests. And my test results think, match almost perfectly me, with sir, Verizon's. I, I, if we're talking about you have it by hills. Oh, okay. Then and we're more, kind of, more general. Okay. Yeah, yeah, try, I'll take it, try to keep it more general. Well, okay, so yeah, I'll wrap it up. All right, I'll wrap it up. So on a general kind of thing, for the city, as a utility, the city has to, I think, oh, I didn't notice the lights. I'm sorry. Um, try to encourage our infrastructure and utilities, and at the same time, try to have them blend into the communities. And I notice on some of the charts up there, um, uh, some of the other communities that were analyzed and what they do to make it compatible. One of them was Durango. I happen to have a second home in Durango in a very expensive neighborhood. And because of their restrictions, the number one complaint at every HOA meeting is the lack of cellular reception. Mm. Th so. Thank you for your comments. I appreciate <laughs> right. it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else, Sarah? That's it, Mayor. All right. Anything else to wrap up here, uh, Mr. Palladini, Bren? Thank yes, you, sir. guys. Appreciate it. I don't have anything else on the agenda for today, so we'll adjourn and see you at 3 o'clock.